Okay, so we'll start. So we have um, three presentations in this session today. Um, and uh, while you're getting your seats, let me just remind you a couple of things that is going on later today. You have a gala dinner at the uh, Harpa, and you're walking there from, from your hotels, right? So there are no buses or anything. You have to do, get the exercise. The Harpa building is, there's going to be an email to everybody, but it's impossible to miss because it's the huge, like enormous glass building down by the harbor. If you see your reflection in the sky, you're at the right place. Um, so um, there is also going to be some interesting demonstration projects later on, and there are some, uh, the, the poster sessions are going to be manned during the day. So make sure to check the schedules and uh, check those other events out. There's also a late night both on the Aspire project um, uh, at, I think, 6 o'clock uh, tonight. So with that, um, we're going to have three presentations all focused on various um, aspects of, of scalability today. Uh, we're going to start with um, Lucas, who's going to tell us all about you know, the, the pains and or joys of getting services connected to Edugain. Okay, well, my name is Lukas Hemmerle. I'm here with the Sheon hat on, but actually I work at Switch. I work in the team that operates and develops Switch AEI, the Shibboleth-based federated identity management infrastructure in Switzerland. So for those who attended the last ENC in Prague, you might remember our little uh, fitness instruction session with the title, How to Trim Your Federation Fit for Edugain. This year, you don't have to do any sit-ups. Um, there is no physical exercise at all, but it's more a presentation that focuses on the services, so the service providers. And it's supposed to be a motivational presentation, not to say speech, because yes, we can get services into Edugain. Yes we can deploy a, a federated identity management system that is globally scalable. And yes, I can get through this presentation in time, hopefully. So first, there will be a short introduction about Edugain, because probably not everybody knows already what Edugain is. Then we will have a look at the current state of Edugain before we then dive into um, some examples how to get a service connected to Edugain. We also will see what the current problems are and what we could do about that. Now, <coughs> this is a map that shows the world and all the identity federations that were known in April 2011. As you can see, there are quite many of them already, mostly in the Western world. And by now, one year later, there are probably more, even more federations available. These are all national identity federations, which means that they work only within one country. Now, the idea behind Edugain is to connect these national federations in a so-called interfederation service. And why are we doing this? Well, these national federations are limited to one country. However, research is more and more international. Also, there are some service providers, like content publishers, that by now are members of many of these uh, national federations. However, they have an international audience, so it also would make sense to get them into an international infrastructure like Edugain. So, Edugain wants to connect these national federations in order to facilitate collaboration between researchers. That's the main idea of Edugain. How does this work? Well, Edugain is an interfederation service that has a framework, of course. On the left, you see some of the documents that build this framework. 
There's, for example, the Edugain Declaration that has to be signed by a federation that wants to become an Edugain Federation member, and there are some technical documents that regulate how the interaction between service providers and identity providers in Edugain can work. <coughs> what we also have to say is that the participating federations are not integrated into Edugain as a whole because only a subset of these service providers in a federation are becoming members of, of Edugain. So there is an opt-in procedure that allows every SP and IDP admin to decide whether he wants to be in Edugain or not. This subset of SPs and IDPs then, um, of course, provide metadata. This metadata is aggregated by a so-called Edugain metadata service. That metadata, which is aggregated, is processed by the Edugain metadata service. It's signed and republished for consumption in the local federations. So that's Edugain very briefly explained. Now, Edugain is a Cheon 3 project. This is a European research project. And by now, Edugain has been operated one year as, a, as an operational infrastructure. What we also have to say that is that Edugain, although being um, a European research project, is not entirely limited to Europe, because as you can see on the left, bottom left, there is Brazil, who also signed the Edugain Declaration, and thus is also an Edugain member by now. Now, if we look at the federations and services that are already part of Edugain today, we see that we have good adoption in the width, which means we have already quite some federations that um, signed the Edugain Declaration and are uh, members, Edugain Federation members. However, we have not yet so many services and IDPs in Edugain, so the depth has yet to grow. If we look at the numbers, it looks like this. Um, we have about 55% of all European national identity federations that are currently members of, of Edugain. If we look on the whole world, it's about 40% of total 30 national federations that are currently listed on the REFETS wiki. I'm not sure whether this uh, information is ac ac absolutely accurate, however, I think um, it should be enough for an estimation. So we have a good width. However, the number of entities that are actually in Edugain after one year of production operation is currently about 2%. So out of these 2,500 SPs and IDPs, this um, is yet a number that can grow considerably, I guess. Of these entities that are currently in Edugain, half of them are SPs, which means half of them are actual services that Edugain users can access. What we also have to say is these 2% most likely will uh, never grow to 100% because it doesn't make sense for every service to become part of Edugain. There are a lot of services that are used only internally at the university, for example, that um, then can be accessed via the, the National Federation. However, this service probably is never used outside of that organization. Therefore, it doesn't make sense for this service to become an Edugain service. If you look at the history of the last year, when uh, the production operation started, um, it looks like shown on this graphic. You probably would have assumed that there's a constant line going up in the, in the number of services. However, it's um, a bit um, a more bizarre curve. On one hand, on the left, you see a drop in number of SPs and IDPs. That was the clean up where we 
um, basically had to remove some entities and SPs from federations that participated in the Edugain pilot phase, but those federations then have not yet signed the Edugain declaration and fulfilled other requirements to become full members when the production operation started. On the other hand, there is this huge spike from September last year to February this year. I will talk more about that in a few slides. But before that, we can draw a um, small conclusion after one year. Um, the good thing is we have no scalability issues yet because of the high number of entities. Um, currently, the number of services uh, is, is not so great that we, we face yet any problems. There are still, after one year of production operation, some test and debugging service operated mostly by NRANs. Um, half of the entities, or half of the services are operated by non NRAN organizations, which means universities, and that is great, of course. Um, in a perfect world, this would be almost 100%, because after all, Edugain is supposed to serve the universities and the, the research and the education community and not primarily the NRAN community. Then if we look at the federations that have most services in Edugain, the crown goes to Italy, followed closely by uh, the Swedish colleagues, because these two uh, country or national federations have most services opted in in Edugain currently. We also can see that there is no killer app right now, so there is no service that is um, very, very uh, attra attractive yet, um, so that it um, has, as a result, um, many IDPs that join Edugain because of this one and only service. However, the question is, will there ever be such a killer service? because a killer service would have to meet some requirements. On one hand, this would be a service that um, is attractive for almost any user, any federated user. Um, it would have been a service that is not already part of a national federation, and so does the scope of such a killer service is, is quite limited. One service that probably could be seen as such a killer service is on the hub, so the Microsoft download software platform. However, this service is already part of, of many national federations uh, right now, so it's not real, it doesn't really qualify as a killer service in Edugain. More likely is the case that we will see smaller, less spectacular services, mostly research services that target a very specific audience. So um, a group of biology researchers, for example, and yeah, that's probably more the driving force for Edugain in the future. Now from the user's per perspective, or the IDP admin's perspective, you could ask, well, now we have Edugain, um, after, one year operate, uh, after one year of operation, where are the services? Well, as you have seen, the number of services right now has yet to grow, and the motivation for IDP administrators to opt in for Edugain is um, not so high right now, because there are not so many attractive services right now. And among these, there are probably also other reasons why there are not yet that many services. So what I tried to find out then is what obstacles are there in addition to this uh, that stop services to join Edugain right now and how can we get around these obstacles. So what I did is try to assist a non NREN service, so a service operated by a research group or a university to join Edugain and together with them the goal was to find any obstacles that are currently in the way. The search for a viable service was not very hard because when we started Switch AI, we already did a pilot with a few services and one of them was Do It, which I will talk about more 
on the next slide. So Do It already was a pilot participant in 2003, and when we asked them half a year ago whether they would be willing to be a pilot candidate, they were very happy and enthusiastic because they are already, well, they were then planning a new version of the Do It platform, and so the timing was perfect. So we helped do it, and how far did we get? Before we answer that question, first some facts about Do It. It stands for Dermat Dermatology Online with Interactive Technology. So it's a, a service that targets mostly medical students um, that focus on dermatology. It's a service that partners with universities from 40 countries in the world. And you see these countries on that map. Um, they already are part of Switch AI. They have been one of the first services actually in Switch AI. So there already is some knowledge around how to deal with federated identity management users. And all in all, do it proved as the perfect candidate for this pilot study. It's great that this presentation is before lunch, because uh, otherwise... Um, <laughs> what you see here is just an example of, of the old Do-It platform. Um, that's probably one of the more harmless pictures. Um, and that's also the reason why they actually want to protect Do-It from uh, ch the general audience um, that accesses it. Because um, people with... Um, <laughs> A weak stomach probably wouldn't uh, appreciate what they see here on these e-learning courses if they just could access to it without any authentication and authorization. So that was the plan. And what's necessary to get a service into Edugain? Well, first, they have to opt in at the local federation, in this case, in Switch AI. Then you, of course, have to adapt the configuration, in our case, the Shibboleth configuration, which means um, you have to change the attribute mappings to some extent, you have to adapt the access control, you have to make something that allows Edugain users to choose their um, organization, so you have to adapt the discovery service, and these are more or less the five steps that are necessary. All of these steps are explained in greater detail on the service provider deployment guide that we created for Interfederation. So if you want to see an example of such a guide, that's the place where you could have a look at it. Now, <coughs> how far did we get? Well, um, Doit is launching a new version in May or June, I think end of May. Um, so it's, it's um, a new release that will be launched very soon. We tested all the, the interfederation stuff with the test version. So um, we set all of these five steps up, as explained before. And we did some cross-federation tests, thanks to the assistance of our German colleagues who were willing to create a few test accounts to check whether things actually work. And so with one exception, um, regarding the data privacy, I think we, we got it all right. So do it was ready for Edugain. However, the question is, is Edugain also ready for do it? Because <coughs> one of the problems was that now we had do it set up for Edugain, but there are not so many IDPs yet whose users could access it via Edugain. And <coughs> now the question is, why is that? Well, there are some impediments that we found during the whole process of adapting Do It for Edugain. Um, one thing is, it seems that the 12 participant federations are not yet completely ready to actually introduce Edugain in their community, which means only few of them have already the infrastructure in place to sign metadata, for example, and only few of them have guides already ready um, that explain users how to uh, proceed if they want to become an Edugain service. And that was a bit a problem because, well, if there is no infrastructure yet finished and the guides are missing, IDPs are hard to convince to actually um, configure their um, IDPs for, for Edugain. 
and thus allow users to access Edugain services. Now, if you are federation manager of such a federation, you could have a look at guides, for example, from us, from Switch. There are also other examples of um, such guides from other federations. I probably will send these links to the uh, relevant list with um, some remarks and hints how to proceed if you don't have already set up your infrastructure. So that was what I was talking just before. If there are a low number of IDPs in an infrastructure like Edugain or basically any federation, um, it's not yet attractive to service providers. On the other side, if there are low numbers of, of service providers, um, there is no huge motivation for IDPs to join. So we have to somehow break this, this cycle and make sure that um, it becomes more and more attractive for IDPs and SPs to actually be part of Edugain. <coughs> Now, one solution to solve this chicken and egg problem um, was tried last year. Um, it's this so-called forced opt-in, uh, where one federation whose name I shall not mention um, basically tried to add all their IDPs and SPs to Edugain. Um, so basically, they just published all their metadata to Edugain. And then the thought or the in intention was that they would change their configuration by themselves as soon as the first users would try to access an Edugain service. On one hand, this idea is great because the number of entities will increase considerably. Um, you don't have to do any opt-in process. Um, and of course, it solves the chicken and egg problem very quickly. However, this idea is very problematic because if an IDP or SP is not properly configured for Edugain, then users will see error messages. And what will they do? Well, either they will contact the service operator and complain there, or they will complain at their IDP. And well, all of these two results are not very um, beneficial to the cause. And therefore, this experiment then was stopped this year sometime, which I think um, is, is was a good decision. Still, I guess it was worth trying it. So what we can say is, in order to get an IDP or SP into Edugain, or basically any inter-federation infrastructure, it has to be specifically configured. There need uh, to be made some adaptations, and for that, guides and instructions are needed doesn't work just out of the box by publishing metadata that's not sufficient. Then we have also seen that uh, there are still are, uh, a lot of discussions currently about data privacy issues. So that's still um, one problem that is not solved entirely. Um, although we, uh, we have to distinguish here. So there are the special cases where a user within a European country access a service in another European country. So that's probably the easier case. However, it gets a bit more complicated if a user from a European country accesses a service in a, a country that has no adequate data protection laws um, like the European Union. And so there are still ongoing discussions. Basically, there are two possible options. There is one fraction that thinks that user consent is the way to go. The other fraction thinks the code of conduct is the way to go. And maybe um, a third option would be to have both of them. However, um, yeah, as mentioned, this is still an ongoing discussion. To illustrate you the problem, in the case where people tend to introduce user consent, it looks like this. Every identity provider installs a software that implements user consent. The software then asks the user after authentication, do you agree that given name, birthday, and whatever attribute is released to 
the service provider X, Y, Z. If he agrees, he clicks yes, and then the IDP administrator can sleep well. So he doesn't have to um, fear that he's legally sued. However, um, that probably works only in some countries because there are people that think, well, this is not really an informed consent because there is a necessity in some case for users to access a specific service that is part of their education and then it gets complicated again. Also, there are people that think user consent is just another annoyance for users um, in the whole locking procedure. Therefore, it's also not a good idea to introduce this. The alternative is located on the service provider side and is called a code of conduct. This basically is a document that says, well, I as service provider promise to be um, good and don't be evil. So it's a bit um, like the Google statement, don't be evil. Um, that code of conduct, on the other hand, yeah, it's just a piece of paper. There are people who think, well, this is based on self-declaration and there are no audits. Therefore, um, yeah, it might not be worth the paper. And so that's the other side of the, of the problem. So the question is, is self-declaration -decla sufficient? Or do you want to introduce audits, which makes the whole thing um, pretty much expensive and complicated? Then there was a fourth impediment. It concerns the attributes, so the attributes are what the service in the end, um, what the service in the end needs. And in order to get these attributes, the service of course needs to somehow declare which attributes it needs. And that's also not very easy right now, because um, not all the services have some uh, declaration in metadata that shows which attributes they need. Actually, it's, it's only about 80% of all SPs, which is a good number per se, but in the best case, it should be 100%. But even if all these attribute declarations are part of the Federation metadata, there is still the problem where um, you have, for example, a service that could use either a given name plus surname or a display name alternatively. And this alternative is, is almost impossible to express in metadata. Still, there might be a solution for that case because um, Shibleth 2.5 will introduce some advanced attribute post-processing mechanisms that could um, allow an SP to actually use both or one of these um, combinations and then the SP administrator would be fine. Another issue with attributes is the attribute harmonization. Um, Andrew Cormack gave a great presentation, I think one or two years about this problem, um, about the attributes that are defined and seen in one country like this and in another country like that, and that there are some incompatibilities in some cases. However, this mostly affects, if I remember correctly, for example, the affiliation attribute. But in, in my experience, most services don't need that attribute. Instead, they need mostly a name, an email address, and a unique identifier. And these attributes are pretty much standardized, I think. Now, the summary and recommendation. So most federations still have some homework to do. Um, I gave you some pointers if your federation is not yet ready. And I will also send an email with some more deployment guides to the list, the EduGain list. So that should help federations to actually complete their infrastructure and get ready to introduce EduGain to their community. For that also, well, the guides are necessary. Good deployment guides are really, really very <coughs> uh, helpful. In our federation, I think we, we couldn't have um, brought um, 500 service providers into the federation without good uh, guides. And we regularly hear from people that 
it actually was very easy to in install such a complex software like Shibboleth having, having good guides. And so we concentrate very much on having good and precise guides. And I can only recommend this to all other federations as well. Then we also should be patient because if you remember from your national federation, it took a lo very long time, most probably, to get um, a good adoption rate. So you have to achieve some critical mass of services and identity providers until you can stop making um, commercials and advertis advertisements for your federation. And the same probably is true for Edugain. So as soon as we have um, a number, a high enough number of SPs and IDPs, it will become a self-runner, I guess. Then from the Xi'an 3 side, we also should still put some emphasis, emphasis on supporting the member federations um, by providing some guides and instructions that help them, for example, to get the metadata signing solved. And that should then help to quickly get the federations ready. Yeah, and last but not least, at least in the beginning, when your federation is ready and the first um, interested um, service provider it, uh, approaches you, you probably will have to do some hand-holding uh, in the first time because you have to explain them first the concept of Edugain, which is also by itself not um, completely trivial. And therefore, you have to be prepared to invest some time, at least in the beginning, to um, help them join Edugain. And yeah, that's my recommendations. And I hope there is some time for questions. Okay, so this was maybe not as much an, uh, of a question as an announcement that, that to the Edugain family, the Canadians have now also joined. So Edugain currently spans three continents, claiming Canada to be one continent, Brazil is one continent, and Europe. So. So that's great. So and it illustrates that Edugain is not focused on Europe but also on other continents. Uh, thanks for a nice presentation and wake up call, but one question on the uh, statistics you presented at the first, uh, and done some comment after that. The question is how did you calculate the number of IDPs? I'm concerned because Hub and Spoke Federations, and I'm coming from one of those, are exposing only the one IDP, although behind that, that are hundreds, maybe. That's true. So um, what I did is actually just pass the metadata file and count the number of IDP descriptors. And as Miro um, correctly states, one IDP in some federations can stand for hundreds of institutions. So in our so case, you should add 219 to the 290, number OK. <laughs> uh, the other question, among that number, what we have is the model of all IDPs voluntarily on the paper <coughs> opt opted in. So they are aware that they can use European services. But our medical schools, for instance, for the do it, they don't have a discovery service part of our guilt, but that's a bigger question. They don't have a discovery service that will let them know there is this, for them, nice, for us, less uh, service you have announced as a, an Edugain enabled case in your. And by the way, they also don't know how to uh, announce that their services one of these days will be available to the larger public. Any kind of catalog in plan? Yeah, catalog certainly would help. Um, what I planned with Do It was to ask the Do It people to contact their partners at the university in some countries. And uh, then they could contact their IT people. And of course, this is a bit cumbersome. But at least in this case, I guess um, it's, it's still the best approach. So th this is interesting. And uh, discovery is going to be something that we're going to have to discuss in many venues. And I think in the Refits community, there's actually a good um, lead on, on discovery in that story. Thank you. Um, Lucas, and uh, right now we're going to turn the, the, the Madonna headset over to, to David Orell, who's going to talk to uh, us about something 
completely different, but yet not, I guess. Uh, we're going to hear um, a presentation about using Moonshot to enable access to cloud infrastructure. So please welcome uh, David Orell. Hi, is the sound okay? It's all right, good. Um, right, morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some work we've done around Moonshot and um, a cloud infrastructure platform that we're building within EduSurf. Um, little background on EduSurf, um, we're based um, in Bath in the UK. Um, we're a not-for-profit company. Um, so we're not funded by government. Everything we've done is, is effectively self-funded through our products and services that we provide. Um, so yeah, that's, that's us. So what we kind of tried to set out to do um, in this work was um, to show end-to-end -end federated access to infrastructure provided in the cloud. I'll come clean in terms of what I mean by the cloud in that context. I'm really talking about infrastructure as a service primarily. Um, so what we tried to do in this was to start fairly simple and say, um, start with SSH. We can, prov we can provision SSH um, servers, Moonshot enable them, um, and show federated access end-to-end. -end. So clearly the fairly obvious outcome of that is that it um, provides the ability to scale quite easily and you're not, need, not needing to deal with um, provisioning of identities. But kind of the other way around, um, we heard in the first session this morning that um, federated access isn't universal. I mean, it's fairly standard within our community, but kind of outside this community, um, people still have reasons not to federate their services. Um, it's not there by default. So is it possible for the cloud to provide a platform that where federated identity is kind of baked in to, to the platform and you can almost um, get, get federated access to infrastructure but also to applications on that infrastructure by default? And that may be via Moonshot or it may be via SAML in the web context. It really doesn't matter which. Um, so I already said a little bit about EduSurf. Um, that isn't Iceland, by the way. That is um, within in Bath, the only hot springs in the UK. So that is just down the road from our office. Sadly, it isn't actually our office. Um, the two areas we tend to work in with EduSurf are access and identity, and um, sort of the web hosting arena, of, um, mainly for government within the UK. So over the, really the last 12 months or so, we've been investing quite a lot in, a, in the cloud platform. And this started initially from some funding in the UK from Hefke and the JISC um, to try and explore some pilot services around cloud infrastructure for the UK education community. And as part of that, we started to build up experience and expertise in, in cloud infrastructure. Um, we're currently, that funding's come to an end. It came to an end in March this year. Um, but that's now ongoing, and we've currently got a beta pilot service running, and there's around about 40 institutions in the UK who are currently part of that pilot. So it's proving fairly, fairly popular so far. If you are from the UK, by the way, and are interested in, in, in trialling this for free, then um, let me know, and um, we'll try and get you signed up. But the other strand to that is that clearly a lot of our business is in um, infrastructure and hosting, and we see this as being a, a platform that will underpin our existing products and services, and those are already starting to migrate across to this platform. So what does it comprise of? Well, everyone's favorite infrastructure company that we heard about earlier on, um, we, we use them quite heavily. Um, for the actual core infrastructure, the storage is provided by um, Isilon-based storage, um, and connectivity-wise, really, the key thing is that we've got a, a 10 gig link from our data center um, onto the Janet backbone. So that's the hardware side. Um, on the software side, um, this is based around VMware's vCloud, um, which you may or may not be aware of. vCloud is really a kind of an orchestration layer on top of a lot of VMware's existing sort of virtualization technologies. I'll talk a little bit about the architecture of that because it's, it's significant. Um, we're also in the process of rolling out um, file and object-based storage, so a web dev interface on top onto that. Um, in terms of the actual software and tools for managing this, well, vCloud comes out of the box with a tool called v vCloud Director, um, which is quite powerful, um, but it's also quite limiting. It's a web-based, flash-based application, so it doesn't really give as much scope to customize and work with that. 
but it does have an extremely comprehensive set of APIs underneath it that we, we, we are actually working with quite heavily in what we've done. What the Canal Director doesn't provide out of the box, we're building our own portal applications on top of that to deal, deal with things like billing and usage, so the stuff, sort of the metric you can't get out of, of vCloud itself. So vCloud's really architecturally split down to these things called virtual organizations. Um, and the virtual organization is, um, so we've got around about 40 of these um, signed up at the moment. And they're kind of subdivided into virtual data centers. So you may be familiar with some of this terminology across other, other VMware stuff. Um, a virtual data center allows you to primarily allocate resources to different parts of your infrastructure. So you can put production services within one VDC and development test services within another. So if someone starts load testing something, it's not going to um, affect your production services. So you can seg segment your applications in that way. It also provides the concept of a catalog, um, which can contain templates for these things called vApps, which I'll talk a little bit more about in, in, in a moment. vApps are the main units you work with within vCloud, not, not really VMs as such, but vApps, which are collections of VMs. Um, but catalogs can also contain ISO, standard ISO-based media. And as an organization, you can build and um, share your own catalogs um, or a cloud provider, in, the, in this case ourselves, can actually publish catalogs. We've got standard templates for most, most OSs in there. Um, a virtual organisa organization can also contain multiple networks as well. So these networks might be Janet, so ours is on Janet, but it also contains the ability to actually set up site-to-site -site VPN, so you can actually create a VPN tunnel to your own organization network and make that visible within within um, your cloud. In terms of identities, um, vCloud is a fairly new product, um, and that's obvious in the slightly limiting, um, limited way that you can manage users and groups. So there's a basic user database with roles associated with this, um, but federated identity is certainly not, certainly not there. So a little bit more about vApps. Um, a vApp is effectively a package of multiple virtual machines. It's expressed as an OVF template, um, but it contains quite a lot of additional metadata. So it contains metadata about how and which networks those VMs connect to. It contains a boot sequence, so if you need some VMs to boot for others, you can, you can um, um, configure that. Um, and it contains um, ne networking information, so within a vApp, you can NAT and you can firewall and you can port forward and you can, you can configure all of this. Um, and the really powerful thing within vCloud is that because all of this is doable via an API, you can effectively programmatically compose vApps from their individual parts or, or build them from pre-built templates. Um, and because the vApp itself can have its own network, you can fence off that network and effectively pick up a whole micro bit of infrastructure in, in a form of a vApp and drop it into a different cloud. So that's the, the unit that we tend to work with within, within our cloud. In terms of sort of zooming out a bit, and this is, this is the infrastructure that we've currently got. So we've got these multiple virtual organizations. We've got the vCloud API on top of that. We've got out of the box the vCloud director application, so you as an organization can log in and manage your infrastructure through that. The API is public, so you can integrate against that yourselves. Um, and what I'm going to show in some of the slides later on is the portal that we've built on top of this API um, that is federated with the UK AMF, so that's via SAML, um, and then that allows us to deploy infrastructure within, within this cloud. So moving on to the Moonshot so, um, side, I imagine most people here know a fair amount about Moonshot already, so I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, it's a Janet-led project. Um, it's um, unlike SAML, which is mainly associated with the web context, um, Moonshot seeks to federate access with potentially any sort of application. Um, it does this by um, firstly building on the existing technologies that are out there and deployed for edgy roam, so Radius and EAP. Um, but one of its major goals is that it seeks to use standard APIs that are already implemented and used by a lot of applications out there, so GSS API, SASL, and the SSPI on Windows, which means that in most cases, 
applications will support moonshot unmodified. And it's not universally true, but in most cases, um, if they're written to these APIs correctly. So you may have seen this sort of standard moonshot animation. So this is in, um, using SSH as an example. So we've got an SSH client um, connecting to the server. Um, the radius server, we assume, is already connected to EduRoam or something like this, and the users have got credentials. So credentialing has taken place by some means. Um, so the client connects to the server. There's a normal SSH negotiation takes place. Moonshot effectively provides the means now to authenticate um, um, over EAP back to your radius server. Um, you authenticate it. So that occurs over radius. At this stage, attributes can be sent back from the radius server to the SSH server, and those could be either radius attributes or SAML. Um, we're not using attributes yet in our deployment. We're literally just using the identifier for the user. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about um, building authorization in based on, on attributes. And then we've got our SSH session established. So what we really set out to, to do in this project was start simple, um, take Linux-based VM um, and see how that we can deploy this um, as, a, as an appliance within our cloud. Um, so we've, we've got a, a um, catalog entry that we've created. Um, it was a CentOS 6.2 um, VM. At the moment, the standard SSHD with CentOS won't support Moonshot, so we're actually running a parallel SSHD alongside the, the OS-supplied one. Um, the advantage of templating this is that we can do all that in advance and configure it as a template. So that's fine. So what I've shown, you can SSH, get a, get a session. We still need the issue of how do we allocate local users within um, on the VM. So we've got an authenticated user on our VM. How do we map that to um, users within that, um, that machine? So to do, that, to do this, we've built um, a couple of um, module, so an NSS module um, and a PAM module um, on Linux. The PAM module is worth pointing out, we're only really using that to auditing. Um, the NSS module, if you're not familiar with NSS, it's a way um, that it's a subsystem on Linux that is used to look up user identifiers. So there's already, for instance, integration, something like WinBind is used to integrate um, with a Windows domain. So it's got a similar set of modules that will talk to a, a Windows domain controller. Um, so we obviously don't have that in this context. So we've built a similar stack that will um, allow us to allocate users dynamically from our web-based console. So how does this work? So the flow goes, goes as such. Uh, we SSH to our server. Um, the moonshot magic takes place against the radius server. So we may get attributes back at that stage. We're currently not doing anything with those attributes. So SSHD makes calls out to PAM. Um, it, SSH doesn't exclusively use PAM, which is why you need to use NSS as well. Um, so all of the authentication doesn't place, take place um, in, in a kind of PAM context. So within the PAM module, we're, we're able to audit this session. Within the NSS module, we then talk on a local socket to a, a daemon, which we've just called Moonbind, um, which is a kind of play on Windbind. Um, and then that talks via an API back to our portal. Um, and that portal can do one of two things. It can automatically, dynamically allocate users on demand. And there's a set of rules that allow, allow that to occur. Or you can have a set of pre-allocated or effectively whitelisted users. Um, and there's a, a REST-based API if you want to automate that pre-allocation yourself. Um, and then we've got a session with our local Linux user and group. So it's worth pointing out that that user and group doesn't exist on the Linux server. It's, it's dynamically allocated via that, that module. So how do we integrate this with the cloud and kind of um, automate a lot of this process? So, so just flipping back, you'll see that this group, user and group allocation is on a vApp basis. Um, not on a, v a per VM basis. So this means that we have a set of rules and users that are shared across all of the, v app, all of the VMs that are deployed within this particular V app. Um, so the way that this occurs, if we want to deploy a new V app with, the, with this um, uh, Moonshot Aware um, VM, 
First, we pick that vApp template out of the, the catalog. We perform a, a guest customization on this. Um, and VMware will do a number of things if VM tools are installed in the machine and the network configuration occurs. Um, we then dynamically perform some of our own customization on that, effectively configuring our Moonbind daemon to be able to talk back to our management console um, so that it can identify, yes, this is a VM that's part of this particular um, v app, so that we're able to configure these rules. So that's done dynamically. Um, and then that is deployed as a new v app within, within our organization. So I'll just, in the last 10 minutes or so, just sort of talk you through this from the user's perspective. So what, what does this look like to an end user? So this is federated login to the management console itself. So this isn't um, the cloud director. This is the, our own application that we've built on top of the APIs. So I'm logged into an example organization. These are my existing um, v apps that I've got created. Um, so I can go and create, create a new, brand new empty v app. There's nothing in there um, at this stage. So I can then either um, manually deploy individual VMs within this VApp, or I can deploy um, pre-built templates, which is what I'm going to do here. So I pick a template. So we've got, as I said, a template with a supplementary SSHD running on a separate port. Um, and then I can drop that into my VApp. So at this stage, it's powered off. None of this customization has yet taken place. Um, nor have I actually allocated how am I going to authorize any users to access to this particular VM. So we've got a, a UI where I can enable the rules for this. So first thing I need to do is um, add in the radius realm or realms that I want to allow access. So I'll put in example.com. So we've got, at this stage, a pretty simple set of rules that how we're going to allocate users that come in from, from that realm. So I can, as I said, I can, you can either do this automatically, um, in which case any new user will automatically be assigned the UID within, within a given range, or I can actually manually add individual users. Um, so it's, there is no other authorization at this stage. So clearly going forward, we'd want to use attributes to be able to um, authorize based on, say, role or group. So once I've added that realm, I can power on the VM. And then if you've used the Moonshot, you may have seen the, um, the, the, the user, end user experience. So I run SSH. Um, if you're in a graphical environment, the Moonshot identity selector point pops up. So if I've not already got an identity within that, I can create, create that ID, add that as a card, send it, and I, the Moonshot authentication takes place. And you'll see there we've got um, a home directory and user information has been allocated for that user. Um, and then that surfaced the back within the console if I want to go in, um, disable or delete that user or change any of their group information I can do within, within the UI as well. So that's sort of fairly, um, fairly simple, but um, complete use cases that we've, we've sort of taken as a, as a starting point. Um, where, are we, where are we looking at this for future? Um, clearly, there's obviously more work we need to do around authorization. One area that I'm quite interested in is um, taking this configuration that we now have around realms and allocation of users that we're configuring per vApp um, and actually moving that into the OVF descriptor. So, the OVF descriptor within vCloud already contains all this other, me other metadata like our firewall rules, our NAT rules. Um, we can potentially extend that to contain um, this additional um, configuration for federated identity as well. So that, that's an area we're, we're keen to explore. Um, so looking at other applications, I mentioned at the start that we, we're currently rolling out a um, web dev interface to storage within our cloud. Um, so, Moonshot enabling that storage for end users to be able to mount that storage on their, on their machines is a potentially interesting piece of work. Um, we're keen to explore the possibilities of, of Windows and Exchange um, um, infrastructure. And finally, there's this kind of area of platform as a service. Um, 
So one of the areas that we're currently looking at within our cloud is, is a product called Cloud Foundry. So this is um, an open source, a um, bunch of open source software that VMware themselves have pushed out um, that provides a, a means to run your own platform as a service. So this allows you to run Java, um, Spring-based apps, or Scala, or Rails, or a number of different um, um, sort of frameworks um, within um, a kind of integrated platform. So I think there's some quite, some quite interesting work we can do in terms of in, in that space. So, yeah, a few thanks to some of my colleagues at EduServe, um, to, to Janet for finding some useful information. If you want to know a little bit more about the work we're currently doing, then we've got a blog, so feel free to read that. And any questions? I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I, I, I thought about one thing when I was looking at this. So how much, how much, I mean, going into the future, how much hand-holding do you think you're going to um, have to give um, the, uh, people who want to use Moonshot? Is it going to, is you're going to, or are you going to reach a tipping point where, you know, people, this is just part of the infrastructure everywhere and you're just going to have to, you, you don't have to do anything yourself? Or do you expect to sort of, you know, at that point, you, you'd see it sort of baked in from, from VMware, for instance. Or is this something you expect to be doing for, for a while? What do you think? Well, certainly one of the advantages of, of infrastructure as a service is certainly at the stage where Moonshot's quite early days, it's not widely deployed. It's not, for instance, in any of the distribution, say Linux distributions. Um, that isn't really a problem in our context because we can pre-build all that and, and effectively bake that into what we're, what we're offering. Um, Obviously, that doesn't help on the client side in terms of getting the end user identity selector um, and the, the extra moonshot libraries on, on people's clients. So that's obviously a, a, um, an area for concern. Um, well, things like uh, the um, virtual desktop, hosted virtual desk desktops for that, for instance. Um, yeah, I mean, I think at, at this stage, we, we we're really quite focused on um, individual um, um, a, a kind of appliances and I'm trying, trying to get a platform out there um, rather than that particular application. Thank you. Anyone else? There is some. Do you see that the high performance computing folks coming in uh, knocking on the door about federated access and for v spinning up VMs and uh, such as uh, the way you described with Moonshot? Uh, Certainly, I mean, certainly the HPC folks have use cases in this area, in this exact area, that um, Moonshot is a very nice fit for them, that's, that's for sure. Um, do you mean within our cloud, or do you mean more generally in terms of, of within, Moonshot? Within your cloud, which I think will precipitate the, the conversation about attributes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think within our cloud particularly, we're not aiming at, at the, um, the HPC community specifically. It's more kind of general, general infrastructure. Um, but as obviously, the, with our 10 gig link onto Janet is quite, a, um, quite an important factor if, if, it, if it is to be used, used by, say, the HPC community. Okay, thanks. while we fiddle with uh, um, microphones and, and presentation equipment. Our next speaker is Andreas Solberg, a um, well-known in, in, in inventor uh, of all, all cool new things, um, it seems. Um, Andreas is going to talk to us about um, one of our uh, Jean's sponsored activities called Federation Lab. And, um, Hello. Good to go. Yeah, so Thank things you. are working. Excellent. Uh, so as Leif said, my name is Andreas. Uh, I'm from uh, Udinat, the Norwegian Research Network. And today I'm going to talk about uh, interoperability. And for obvious reasons, I'm going to use the term interop. Uh, so I'm going to talk about interop uh, what, and interop issues. So interop issues is what I'm particularly interested in. 
because we don't like it. Uh, what does cause interop issues? And uh, I uh, have been working a lot with SAML federations, so uh, most of these things are a bit generic, but uh, my examples are taken often from the, from the uh, SAML uh, implementations and SAML, SAML word. So I'm not going to argue that flexibility is a really nice and good thing, but it also has its drawbacks because when there's a lot of flexibility and options, you will see that implementations will do subsetting and will do implementations of parts of the full specification and all the options. And what will happen when you have a lot of subsets that are going to interrupt? Uh, well, it won't always work. Uh, you have deployment options. When you are going to deploy a software, you have a lot of options that you need to configure. Uh, people will configure things differently, and then it won't always work. Um, when there's a lot of options uh, in the protocol, uh, there will be bugs that usually are not discovered unless you're doing something corner case uh, when you're talking to a specific other vendor, something like that. Then you will see new bugs that you were not aware of. And uh, usually it's not the software implementers that will discover these bugs, it will be end users. I'm returning to that later. When the specifications is not clear, it's obvious that people will interpret it differently and will also cause interrupt issues. Uh, another thing is error handling. Um, when it's very common to not do error handling properly, and it might be in some situations that when you're doing uh, some uh, some specific features, you have to rely on the other end having to report that it doesn't support a specific feature, uh, unless the end user will uh, end up with the error message. So, the uh, last thing I would like to mention is uh, when there is a lot of options in the protocol, uh, there is very nice if there is some um, feature negotiation phase or if there is a language of expressing what feature and what deployment options that you have chosen. And uh, that's not always the case that this uh, is sufficient uh, to cause interrupt, but it's something that's important. So here is, um, here is something called Postal Slow uh, that a lot of developers uh, like and follow. Uh, I found it to be uh, come from back in the, uh, from defining the TCP protocol. So it says, be strict in what you send and generous in what you receive. And most people would agree that that's a good way to approach uh, to increase interop, uh, but I also uh, like to mention that it might work in the other uh, direction as well, because uh, even when you follow this principle, the errors or the interop issues that you will introduce will be less, m much, uh, much more difficult to discover, uh, because you will have a bug in your software but it will still most likely work with most of the products, but there will always be someone that is more strict than the others, and then you will have a very uh, specific interrupt issue that is difficult to discover and will cause, of course, uh, problems for your end users. And here, interesting thing. So, some of the protocols deal with XML, and when you're doing security, you have to sign thing and you have XML signatures, including SAML. So uh, um, while this mostly works most of the time, there, uh, the XML signatures specification is actually referring to a lot of, uh, lot of other specifications. So there's a lot of options also inside the XML, specification, XML signature specification, which is part of, in example, the SAML specification. So it will also in significantly increase the overall number of uh, options that you have when you are deploying uh, 
SAML software. So uh, a few examples. So you have in the max XML signature spec, it says that DSA SHA-1 is the only one that is really required to be supported, but actually it never is almost never been using, be, uh, is used. Uh, in contrast, you have the RSA SHA-1, which is almost always used, but actually is not requ entirely required. Um, SHA-256 is something that some vendors are starting to implement, but is not yet uh, ready to be deployed. But when people start deploying and using it, it will be really difficult to, to know when to turn it on. Um, you have canonicalization, uh, which also have a lot of options. So vendors and so software do it different ways, which ha means that, um, yeah, may cause problems. Then you have in the SAML specification, what are you really going to sign? There's also options there. You can sign uh, the response or the assertions or, yeah, etc. And then, of course, you have X509. When it's used, also has a lot of uh, uh, different interpretations and uh, different uh, situations on, uh, on how trust is uh, validated. So, to some, uh, some more specific uh, examples of uh, potential interop issues. Uh, here is uh, text from the SAML specification covering time timestamps. So it says that you have to use uh, excess date time uh, from the XML schema uh, data types. But then it says that you explicitly that you have you must not include the time zone component. But what's interesting is that most implementations usually would not like to uh, use uh, to, to implement their own parses of, of time. So they will use a generic one, which is very likely to, to uh, allow time values that include the time zone components. That means that vendors, and we have seen some examples of this, that include the time zone in the time, uh, in the, in the issue, issue time. Um, field, it will work almost always. But still, their software is having a bug, and it will uh, occur, uh, the interrupt issue will occur when this software that has a bug speaks with a, a specific implementation that actually are more strict when it comes to validating timestamps. Um, these are things that are a bit interesting. and. Uh, may cause some, uh, some problems to end users. Another topic that's very common to have interop issues with it is URL canonicalization. Uh, it's how do you compare two to, uh, to URLs to be, uh, to be matching. When a spec says something like, uh, if it's present, the actual recipient must check that the URI reference uh, identifies the location at which the message was received is something that is not entirely clear how to interpret. So how do you really, um, and I think a lot of specifications that deal with the web and redirects uh, include sentences like this. And some of them are more specific than others about how to actually do URL canonicalization and how to compare. Here you see two, two URLs in the XML message. You redirect to this URL. Uh, but when the user actually ends up at this URL, is done that a matching? Um, I would guess that some implementations would say yes, and others would say no. Sometimes it would work, and sometimes it would not work. Typical, uh, typical usage would be that implementations would, would like to add uh, state parameters to, to return to URLs, which will sometimes work and sometimes not. So there's a lot of things that can cause interrupt issues, but what will happen when they really um, when it occur? Well, it usually is not something that you uh, encounter during implementation phase, but during a uh, large scale deployment. And it will occur to the end users. 
And usually it will have an unhandled exception. It will return a really bad error patch to the end user, which is, I would say, not fair to the end users. Typically, there are no contact points um, for the end user to really get in to contact the persons that would be able to fix the interop issue. Sometimes it's not even clear who is to blame for interop issues, because if they're unclear how the deployment uh, rules are, then you could have a kind of conflict when some vendor and some other are not ar ar arguing about what is the correct uh, option. Usually al also users don't really care about reporting things like this. Like they, have a, they are used to having a lot of error messages on web, and when they have something, they will not necessarily make a large effort to actually uh, make sure that it's fixed. And I would also assume that federation operators, IDPs, service providers, have so much work to do already, so they would not constantly stay monitoring logs to see if there might be some users that have a problem, and then contacting the user and trying to figure out what's wrong. Usually they are uh, relying on being contacted about a specific issue, then fixing it. This problem uh, with interop issues is something that will get larger as time goes because you are mostly used to having Shiblet Federation with one software uh, within a limited scope. Now we are moving into federations, as Lucas have been speaking about, uh, making uh, it scale a lot. You're not on any longer dealing with shibboleth only software. There's a lot of vendors doing a lot of different implementations, and you will see service providers that do their own uh, very limited uh, subset implementations as well, built into their product, more likely to have interrupt issues than the more established vendors. So, to end users, you'll see something like this, something like this, like this or like this. Um, we would not like that to happen, so how to, can we sure ensure interrupt to, to uh, or encourage interrupt and uh, counteract uh, these kind of issues in our federations? One approach that we have been uh, do, uh, doing is to make more specific rules in a deployment context about uh, limiting the flexibility and defining configuration options that are required for the, the entities to follow. Uh, we have an example of a work called SAML2INT, which is actually now being adopted by Cantara Initiative to will be turned into a more standardized uh, deployment specification. Uh, so that's really uh, good. Um, it will increase the chance of interoperability because it uh, don't leave the, the option to the each individual and this to select what is preferable to them to, to uh, how to configure their product, but instead provide some guidelines that will be the same for everyone. So, even though um, SAML2INT is used a lot and a lot of federations are already referring to it. It's a bit difficult because these are pretty hardcore stuff that is difficult to service providers and identity providers to actually make sure that are they compliant according to this specific deployment profile. Um, so um, it's not as optimal as I, I would like it to be. Um, in, uh, in contrast, it works more like uh, this uh, is, uh, dispute resolution when there are conflict and you can always have something to refer to to actually make sure what is the correct behavior. Another approach that we have been involved in would be uh, Kantara matrix testing. We have been participating with the product Simple SAML uh, PHP. Uh, we have spent several in weeks intensive work to go through a program, a test program with Kantara Initiative. They have been doing this uh, for a lot of, uh, for many years. Um, uh, prior it was uh, Liberty Alliance. Um, 
So what actually are done in the, this, uh, this matrix testing is that there was five products that were participating in a team, daily uh, video calls to, this, to spend time on configuring project to behave in a specific way, then afterwards walking through the test phase, uh, making sure that everything is working. Um, so this approach, uh, in this approach, we did everything we could to actually try to make it work. And when it succeeded, we uh, were passed as, uh, as compliant and uh, conformant, uh, certified to, uh, with this metric testing program. So while this approach uh, gives results and I would be able to find some errors, uh, at least severe errors, uh, there are also some errors that are likely to pass this. Also typically, the kind of errors that I have been talking about earlier. So um, we have done an another approach as well, uh, which is from the giant program, uh, the Federation Lab. We did it first with the SAML. What it, do, uh, what it do is that it simulates being an identity provider in the SAML federations, and you are able to connect your service provider, configure it to trust the identity provider, and you start a tool that will in back channel automatically test approximately 80 different flows that are not things that are likely to work, but instead things that are likely to break. Um, and it breaks a lot, so it finds problems with, uh, with software, like it was intended to do. So it's, um, the tests covers things like security issues, uh, errors, spec validations, uh, and non-recommended deployment options. So this approach, I would uh, state that is more likely to discover interrupt issues than the matrix testing. So for the service provider to go ahead and, uh, and uh, test their service provider, it would first need to register metadata for their service provider, uh, then configure their product to work with the with the test lab, and then start the tests. So I'm going to show you that. First, I'd like to mention uh, a library that was developed uh, together with this, uh, this project, which is called SAML Meta.js. Those of you that were uh, attending the reference meeting typically saw this library being used as part of the peer project. But this uh, was uh, initially uh, used for uh, as user-friendly way of service provider being able to configure their uh, metadata to be used with a test. So when they have configured the metadata, they would first perform the initial connectivity test, which is the most basic test that are very likely to succeed. When it's passed, you are able to start all the other test flows. So you just have to click once to start the tests, and that will uh, interactively show you as it pa passes uh, or not passing each test. So it will count to something like 80 tests. And each of these lines uh, have different colors for when it succeeds and when it fails. Uh, each of these lines are actually very complex flows. Each of them are different, doing all kinds of various stuff that are intending to try to make your implementation break. So it does things that fails, breaks with a specification, things that, uh, uh, yeah, all kind of, of, of things. So when you run this uh, tool, you will have a report with a lot of things that are wrong or not recommended with your service provider. So you can click on each of these uh, test flows and see the exact message that's, that are sent back and forward. Uh, to the to your service provider, and it also states what is uh, what is wrong. So, what uh, this is uh, something that we did uh, quite some time ago. So, what's new last year is that we have been extending this uh, test infrastructure to cover a new emerging standard, which is called OpenID Connect, which is something that's likely some of you have heard about. 
which is a uh, promising um, authentication uh, protocol that will be the new version of OpenID, which is not, which uh, is actually a thin layer on top of uh, UAuth 2.0. Um, you will be able to learn more about OpenID Connect in a later uh, session with uh, Roland. Um, so this is a joint uh, effort, a collaboration between Giant, where we are doing the implementation, and Kantara initiative that will deploy and uh, operate, and we work together with them because the OpenID Connect specification is not entirely set yet. So we are involved in that pr 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 process as well. So Roland Hedberg uh, had done all the work with the, the test tool, uh, the hardcore tests that do all the various stuff with OpenID Connect, similar to what I just showed you with SAML that we did earlier. So I am responsible for the front end, and we have improved the front end a bit from our SAML work. Next up would be that we will integrate this more and extend it and make it more stable to cover both SAML and OpenID Connect. Uh, so the back end test tool is written in Python, and the front end is uh, written in JavaScript using Node. Uh, it's already available at public technology preview at this URL. Or, um, yeah. So, here I'm going to show you how it works with OpenID Connect testing. It looks like this, and you say that you are going to test OpenID Connect. You have a configuration screen where you actually configure uh, the endpoints of your uh, OpenID Connect provider. This test case is a bit different from, uh, from uh, the SAML thing in uh, respect to that it tests the IDP side or the provider side uh, instead of the service provider side. So it means actually uh, uh, some additional complexity. And the complexity lies in the user interaction because this backend tool have to deal with entering username and password, dealing with authorization, grant, consent, all these kind of user interactions that are impossible to, to foresee. So what we do is that we uh, take the, we find an unexpected result from the responder, uh, from the page, uh, we present it, but we tweak the content, put it in an iframe, uh, including JavaScript to intercept all user interaction and store that user interaction in a configuration instead of uh, actually doing the actions. So here, uh, the tests are already running, running, and you see there are some red uh, and some green tests here. Someone is failing, someone is not. Each test flow has a lot of subtests that needs to be passed for each test flow for the test to be succeeded. You can click on to see the exact content of the messages that are actually trans transferred. Uh, this uh, screen scrape demo is uh, a bit old, uh, so this tool is constantly being uh, improved. Uh, the implementations are also constantly being improved because the specification is, as I said, not yet done. Uh, but uh, we think that even though the OpenID Connect specification is uh, has a lot of simple a lot of uh, aspects that are a lot simpler than the SAML, and SAML is famous for being kind of flexible and having a lot of options. Uh, OpenID Connect has a lot of uh, flexibility as well, and there's a lot of ways that you can have interrupt issues with. Uh, OpenID Connect. Here we're going to test another provider. And uh, please uh, note that it will have a completely different user interface. So the login page, as you see now, will uh, look differently. You have this checkbox, everything needs to be, and here is the, the resulting configuration that is intercepted using the JavaScript that catches all the actions. Here is the consent page that was uh, was uh, configured afterwards, and now we're running the tests again. So
So I think that this work is uh, important because uh, some effort in making sure that the products are interoperable and deployments are interoperable will save the end users from a lot of problems in the future. So that's what I, what I got. So I um, think we might have time for potential question, if there are some. Well, sorry. <laughs> in regard to the federation uh, testing tool, um, is it currently possible to sort of automate the test and have that mailed or whatever? Um, we have a platform where we change a lot of stuff, and we would actually like sort of to automate after each deployment, run it through the federation lab and make sure that we didn't break stuff uh, too bad. Yeah, a very good question, and the the answer is that uh, that's part of the design. So, uh, but as I said, this is uh, things that are currently being developed. So we have not documented and provided this interface to be used yet. But uh, it will be, um, as you see, the design of this, the, at least the latest version, used dealing with OpenID Connect, is uh, based on a very interactive front end that actually using all the REST interfaces towards the, the back end. So. Uh, by design, it's very simple to just put that REST, app, make use of that REST API into your test deployment or uh, script. Uh, it will take some time to run though to through all the test flows, but uh, yes, that's the that's the intention. Cool. Thanks. Hi. Um, in general, do you think um, it would make sense for a service to offer a strict option where you say, if you want to test what you've made against, uh, in just in general, any service? Um, because normally it might accept lots of different things, but you want to know if your um, client works well. So you just set an option saying, treat me now, strictly now because I'm testing my own uh, relying party. Yeah, that's a very good point as well. And we have thought about making different profiles of what you would like to test. So typically, you could have a very strict one that tests everything that uh, could go wrong or anything that's very, very strict, things that are uh, running all the tests. And also, uh, we are thinking about maybe making different profiles for different contexts. So like Edgain has have specific rules that are only relevant to Edgain. So it would be okay, nice to have an Edgain profile where you say that I would like to test this in Edgain context to make sure that I follow all the, the rules that applies to deployments in Edgain. So, uh, so yes, that's a good idea. And uh, we are not yet there yet, but it's a uh, natural further work. That's an interesting point. Uh, with, I'm involved in this Cantora business that you mentioned, and we have um, we have national bodies lining up to they they actually asking us for a commercial version of this that they could you know, pay to have their national federation testable. I think that probably aligns well with our one of our keynotes this morning that this sort of move to consumerization. And I, the the reason we've seen a declining interest in full matrix testing and an increase in this in, in testing deployments is precisely because there's less buying software and more buying services. That's the trend, right? So you want to test, if you're a national body, if you're a national government EID federation, you actually want to make sure that your, the services you buy for that federation work. You don't really care about the underlying software that they use, and that's something that those vendors have to straighten out, but the, you want to test the services, and that's why deployment testing is probably that's why it's on the rise. Anyway, are there any other questions? With that, I think we'll thank Andreas. <laughs> and I uh, hope you check out all of the other interesting presentations um, today and tomorrow. Um, have a nice lunch.